Sup, Chooms, how y'all living? Hope everything is Nova and you're all having a preem week. All right, Chooms, it is long past time we finally do a video on the subject of diffuse thinning, also known as DUPA, and on the subject of retrograde alopecia. In fact, for a very long time now, I hesitated to do a video on DUPA and retrograde alopecia because there didn't seem to be all that much research on it. Since this is a science-based and research-based channel for hair loss switchers, I really didn't want to make a video that was purely speculative since I was worried that people would draw the wrong conclusions and end up pursuing fake treatments. However, I knew I had to say something soon because in the past year or so, there has been a record surge of new bro science and misinformation about this subject. I've heard people claiming that DUPA and retrograde alopecia aren't actually forms of androgenic alopecia at all, and therefore they cannot be effectively treated with 5-AR inhibitors like finasteride or dutasteride. They'll make claims that they're caused by things like stress, vitamin deficiencies, or prolactin levels from masturbating too much. This is all completely wrong, of course. DUPA and retrograde alopecia are literally just unpatterned, atypical forms of androgenic alopecia, so conventional hair loss medications will absolutely still work. But the kind of misinformation we are starting to see about this condition is becoming so prevalent that I am worried that people are going to start believing it unless I intervene soon. So I think it is long past time that I take a silver sword to this subject and intervene by using my Witcher senses to find out what is going on with both dupa and retrograde alopecia. So when most of us think about androgenic alopecia, we usually associate it with the type of hair loss we see from the Norwood Hamilton scale. It's true that when men experience androgenic alopecia, this is the type of pattern that usually occurs. However, it's important to remember that androgenic alopecia is very, very diverse. There are over 250 genes that are associated with androgenic alopecia after all, so even though the Norwood scale is the most common way androgenic alopecia progresses, it is not the only way. Some men will experience a more diffuse pattern of hair loss similar to what we see in women, which is also known as female pattern hair loss. It is so different from the typical male pattern that it has its own assessment scale known as the Ludwig scale that I'm showing you right here. There's also the pattern of retrograde alopecia where people lose hair above their ears and on the back of the head, which is a location known as the donor area since those hairs are usually more resistant to DHT and thus are commonly extracted for the purpose of hair transplantation surgery. So both dupa and retrograde alopecia are especially bad since not only are they forms of hair loss, but they can also make those afflicted with either condition ineligible for a hair transplant. However, even though these atypical patterns don't match with the more common pattern of male pattern baldness that we see in the Norwood Hamilton scale, these patterns of hair loss have actually been known about for a long time. To better examine this, let's go back in time and visit with one of the founding fathers of hair loss research as well as a superhero of the Hair Cafe Cinematic Universe, Dr. James B. Hamilton. Back in 1951, when Dr. Hamilton published his version of what would later become the Norwood Hamilton scale, he pointed out that there were some patterns of hair loss that didn't fit the typical male pattern. Here is the original Hamilton scale, and it is a little different than the Norwood Hamilton scale that we know today. For example, let's look very closely at the sketches for the most severe types of hair loss in the scale, type 7 and type 8. In those sketches, Dr. Hamilton indicates that not only is there hair loss on top of the head, but there is also hair loss that develops just above the ears and just above the neck. So what we call today retrograde alopecia was something Dr. Hamilton observed in the most advanced cases of male pattern baldness. So even areas of the donor region that are less affected by androgenic alopecia can still thin out. This is a reason why sometimes transplanted hairs don't last very long and why it is important to stay on finasteride even after a hair transplant. Even though hairs in the donor region are more resistant to the trash hormone DHT than hairs on the top of the scalp, they are not totally resistant. Dr. Hamilton noted in his article that androgenic alopecia doesn't always fit the typical male pattern and that there are variant patterns besides the typical patterns he described. In fact, in his original classification scheme, Dr. Hamilton defined type 3 hair loss as a whole separate type containing all the patterns of androgenic alopecia that didn't fit into the typical male pattern. However, based on his observations of hundreds of subjects, he claimed that 99% of cases of baldness did fit into a scheme, so these unusual patterns were rare. Despite the fact that atypical hair loss patterns are rare, one of the photos in his article 
does show an example of what we would now call today retrograde alopecia, even though he doesn't use that specific terminology. Anyways, we do have more recent data on both retrograde alopecia and DUPA. Much of this research comes from hair transplant surgeons. The reason hair transplant surgeons seem to care more about these conditions than general dermatologists is because to a dermatologist, androgenic alopecia is just androgenic alopecia. It doesn't matter whether it is from a typical male pattern or if it's from a diffuse pattern or retrograde alopecia. They're all treated the same way by dermatologists with 5 air blockers. So if you go to a dermatologist and you say that you have DUPA or retrograde alopecia or they diagnose you that way, they'll prescribe you a 5 air blocker just as they would if you came in with the typical Norwood pattern of male pattern baldness. However, for hair transplant surgeon, the type of pattern matters a great deal. Diagnosing DUPA or retrograde alopecia is critical for them doing their jobs correctly. Both DUPA and retrograde alopecia affect the donor area, and because of the donor dominance theory proposed by Dr. Orndrick many decades ago, we know that the success of a hair transplant depends on how affected the donor hair is by androgenic alopecia. Donor dominance just means that hair growth is not affected by where it happens. Instead, it is dependent on the predetermined genetics of the transplanted hairs. As Dr. Orndrick discovered, Hair from the donor region transplanted to the balding areas of the scalp continued to grow very well, while hair from the balding region transplanted to the usual donor region continued to miniaturize at the same rate. Later experiments by Dr. Nordstrom proved that this theory is absolutely correct. In those experiments, hair from balding regions continued to miniaturize when transplanted to the forearm, while hair from non-balding regions continued to grow normally. This was strong evidence that it was the inherent genetics of each hair follicle that mattered in androgenic alopecia, and not the environment surrounding the follicle. This data, of course, drove the Blutflu conspiracy theorists absolutely crazy, and they jumped through all these kind of hoops and mental gymnastics in order to try to legitimize their completely obsolete theory. But every time they try, they fail miserably, which is why they become a meme in the hair loss community. I made a video going into more detail on the donor dominance theory that I'll link below, so make sure you watch that video if you want a thorough explanation as to why it is the genetics of each individual hair fall that matter and not their location on the scalp. Anyways, if the donor area is affected by androgenic alopecia because the patient has DUPA or retrograde alopecia, the transplanted hair is not going to do very well. This is why transplant surgeons are particularly interested in finding out if patients have these patterns before performing hair transplantation surgery. So even though Dr. Hamilton discussed variant patterns of androgenic alopecia and included a photo of a patient with retrograde alopecia in 1951, the first formal description of retrograde alopecia didn't appear until this this article appeared in the Journal of Dermatologic Surgery way, way back in the distant past year of 2021. So this first report on retrograde androgenic alopecia is pretty short, it's just two pages long. In the article, the authors designate retrograde alopecia as a pattern of androgenic alopecia that doesn't fit into the Norwood Hamilton scale for men or the Ludwig scale for women. They describe the retrograde alopecia pattern and actually give it the name retrograde alopecia. The authors say specifically that this pattern is not a new form of hair loss, but instead it has all the clinical features of androgenic alopecia except the male pattern hair loss pattern that we associate with the Norwood Hamilton scale. Like men with male pattern hair loss, the hair loss happens gradually after puberty and there is a gradual increase in vellus hairs and a decrease in normal looking terminal hairs. In other words, we're talking about typical features of androgenic alopecia. The only difference here is just the pattern. With retrograde alopecia, it is the lower occipital region that loses hair as seen in this figure here. You can see some more advanced cases in these two figures that you can see in these pictures right here. So the author stated that, quote, Retrograde alopecia is likely a subtype of male pattern hair loss that affects patients to varying degrees. It is important to be aware of this type of hair loss when considering donor hair for hair transplant." Unquote. The authors conclude by noting the typical findings of androgenic alopecia in the clinical history, the physical exam, and most importantly, trichoscopy and actual scalp biopsies which show evidence of hair follicle miniaturization. So in this article, the diagnosis of androgenic alopecia was established not only by observation, but also by using a trichoscope and by doing scalp biopsy, so there's no doubt that what's happening during retrograde alopecia is actually androgenic alopecia. If any of these findings were present in the areas of the scalp normally associated with male pattern baldness, no one would doubt that the diagnosis of androgenic alopecia was correct. The only people who can't accept this are those that cling to the outdated blood flow slash scalp tension theory, because according to that theory, androgenic alopecia is due to scalp tension or restricted blood flow, and it should always have the 
typical male pattern of baldness. But with retrograde alopecia, the exact same process is going on that is happening in men with male pattern baldness, except that it is happening in an area of the head that is not subjected to scalp tension or any other possible limitation of blood flow. These areas are nowhere near the Gallia aponeurotica, which the scalp tension cultus feels where all the scalp tension that is happening is causing hair loss. So they can't explain this pattern of retrograde alopecia because clearly this pattern, just like the more typical male pattern, is genetically determined and has nothing to do with blood flu or scalp tension. Of course, this is just one of the many, many reasons why the blood flu theory is wrong. I could probably even make an entire video series explaining just how unfair fathomably stupid this theory and its proponents are, and as a matter of fact, I already did do that, so I'll link my blood flu videos below if you want to see why people who promote the blood flu theory had their Gallia aponeuroticas shoved right up their asses. So. Let's get to the last study on retrograde alopecia. The previous study was just a series of observations, but the next study on retrograde alopecia digs deeper into the prevalence and clinical features of retrograde alopecia. This study was published in 2023 and it is from Egypt. It is titled, quote, Retrograde Alopecia, Prevalence, Patterns, Dermoscopic Features Among Egyptian Men, a Cross-Sectional Study, unquote. In the study, the authors reviewed 1,000 cases of antrogenic alopecia in men over 20 years of age who were seen in the dermatology department of the Al Hussein Hospital. It's important to note that all of these men had the diagnosis of androgenic alopecia confirmed by dermoscopic examination. So out of 1,000 men with androgenic alopecia, 50 of them had the pattern of retrograde alopecia. So that's 5% of cases. From these cases, the authors developed a classification scheme aimed at determining whether the donor area was involved or not, with the idea of trying to determine which subjects with retrograde alopecia were still candidates for a hair transplant. The the article then shows several examples of the different patterns. Notice that it is possible to have both retrograde alopecia and a more typical pattern at the same time, which is why many of these cases were referred for hair transplants. The authors leave no doubt that despite the unusual pattern, this is still androgenic alopecia that we're talking about here, Chooms. First of all, like I said, many of the men also had a typical pattern of androgenic alopecia as well as the retrograde alopecia pattern. Also, dermoscopic examination revealed a percentage of vellus hairs above 20%, which is diagnostic of androgenic alopecia. However, in most men, even with severe male pattern baldness and retrograde alopecia, there still is a strip of the horseshoe that remains, and it remains healthy enough that it's possible to source donor hair from that transplanted region. So that's actually great news for men with both the male pattern and retrograde alopecia, because it shows that it is still possible to find donor hair, even though it may be more limited than usual. So. The bottom line of this article from the transplant surgeon's point of view is that you must examine the donor area carefully for signs of retrograde alopecia. However, from our point of view, these two articles both show that retrograde alopecia is just a variant of androgenic alopecia with the exact same mechanism, namely the trash hormone DHT. The fact that androgenic alopecia can develop in areas that are not supposed to have increased scalp tension or decreased blood flow is just yet another nail in the coffin for the blood flow theory, but it is only one of many nails. Like I said, I've debunked that idiotic theory many, many times in many videos before, and I'll link them all below. Okay, well, what about DUPA? DUPA stands for Diffuse Undifferentiated Pattern Hair Loss. Well, if Dr. Hamilton was the first to publish a photo of a case of retrograde alopecia in 1951, then it's only fitting that his future collaborator, Dr. Norwood, is the one who first defined DUPA. He did it in this article here from 1975. Okay, I can't pass by the fact that Dr. Norwood's first name is Otar. Here's a picture of Dr. Otar T. Norwood. I wonder what the T is supposed to stand for. But anyways, this is the article where Dr. Norwood took Dr. Hamilton's original classification scheme and then added his own touches in order to get the Norwood-Hamilton scale that we all use today. It is interesting that this figure is similar to Dr. Hamilton's figure, but Dr. Norwood got rid of the retrograde alopecia that Dr. Hamilton showed in his figure at stage 7. So I don't know if this was intentional or maybe it was an error by the artist who copied Dr. Hamilton's figure, but because of this, people have forgotten that severe male pattern baldness is often accompanied by an element of retrograde alopecia. Anyways, Dr. Norwood doesn't mention retrograde alopecia, but he does note that the possible variations of androgenic alopecia are infinite. Amongst these variations is diffuse alopecia, which he defines in this article. He distinguishes two types of diffuse alopecia. The first is diffuse unpatterned alopecia, or DUPA. In this type, there is a general 
decreased density without a pattern, though it is usually more severe over the top and front. The other type is diffuse pattern alopecia. Here the pattern resembles the male pattern, but the areas don't become completely bald. So he comments that diffuse hair loss is more common in women. Dupa is really just another name for female pattern hair loss, but Dr. Norwood's study was done in just men, so these patterns were seen in men too. Unfortunately, unlike Dr. Hamilton who created a special category for unusual patterns of hair loss, Dr. Norwood lumped Dupa cases into whatever pattern they came closest to matching, so we can't really get an idea about the incidence of Dupa in men from his study. So with Dupa, we're basically talking about female pattern hair loss that is happening in men. That's the perfect way to see it. Women with androgenic alopecia typically have a different pattern of hair loss versus men. That is why women have a different hair loss classification system, specifically the Ludwig scale. In women, androgenic alopecia begins with gradual thinning at the part line that gradually spreads and worsens over the years. Now, there are more articles on female pattern hair loss than on retrograde alopecia, but most of these articles are on female pattern hair loss as it happens in women. Female pattern hair loss in women has features similar to hair loss in men, including progressive miniaturization and decreasing hair density. However, in women, the response to 5-AR blockers may be different than it is in men. Unlike in men, one milligram per day of finasteride was not effective, although doses of 2.5 milligrams daily or five milligrams daily were effective as seen in small studies. It may be that in women, there are other factors that make androgenic alopecia harder to treat than it is in men. Women do have lower DHT levels to begin with, so it may be that women who get female pattern hair loss have more sensitivity to DHT in their hair follicles than men, which would require these higher doses. The fact that there is a response to fiber blockers at all, though, does indeed show that DHT does play a role in women as well as in men when it comes to treating androgenic alopecia. It is also possible that we just don't have adequate studies in women. Women of childbearing age usually are prohibited from taking finasteride, and women were excluded from all the clinical studies of finasteride for hair loss, which is why it's FDA approved for men only. Of course, they don't have prostates either, so women were essentially excluded from all the major clinical studies. So I think this question as to how well finasteride works in women with female pattern hair loss is just a subject that has not been adequately studied yet. However, unlike in women, there is no evidence that diffuse unpatterned hair loss is any different from male pattern hair loss or that it responds differently to any treatment. For example, this article here includes several examples of both diffuse pattern and diffuse unpatterned hair loss as seen in these photos. Another study looked at both men and women with female pattern hair loss, this one here from China. Trichograms were done and showed that both men and women with female pattern hair loss had increased vellus to terminal hair rate ratios, which is typical of what is seen in androgenic alopecia. This figure shows a man on the left and a woman on the right, both with female pattern hair loss. There is no difference in the pathological findings between men and women with female pattern hair loss. The authors did note that men with female pattern hair loss also had hair loss in the parietal and occipital areas, which is exactly where men with retrograde alopecia have hair loss. So there can be some overlap between dupa and retrograde alopecia. But the bottom line is that although Although these patterns are rare in men, female pattern hair loss, dupa, and retrograde alopecia all overlap, and they all have the same characteristics as androgenic alopecia that occurs in the typical male pattern. The fact that these variants occur has been known since at least 1951. Hair transplant surgeons are particularly aware of these conditions because they can cause a failed hair transplant. That's why articles like this one specifically point out that it is very important to recognize dupa as a possible contraindication to a hair transplant procedure. So like I said at the beginning of this video, there aren't a whole lot of studies looking specifically at dupa or retrograde alopecia because these are relatively rare conditions. However, there is absolutely no evidence in men to suggest they respond any differently to treatment with 5 air blockers than men with typical male pattern baldness. Dermatologists just treat these patterns like anyone else who has androgenic alopecia. The only real concern is the negative impact these conditions may have on the ability to get a hair transplant in the future. Although. As someone who has been involved in the hair loss fight for a good long while now, I think I should mention that having personally observed many people with androgenic alopecia, people who have dupa or retrograde alopecia tend to bald pretty damn aggressively. Everyone I have ever met who is a Norwood 6 or 7 in their 20s or early 30s started off as a diffuse thinner. So if you are a diffuse thinner, you'll still want to get on treatment, of course, but you may want to consider a stronger treatment like 0.5 milligrams of dutasteride or possibly even 2.5 milligrams 
milligrams of dutasteride. And I talk about the significance of those doses in my perfect dose of dutasteride video, which I'll link below. And you may especially want to consider that if you're a diffuse thinner in your teens. Anyways, this month I've already tackled two topics that my viewers have frequently requested, telogen effluvia in my last video, and retrograde alopecia and dupa in this one. So we're going to go ahead and move on to some other topics in the near future, including hopefully some new treatments in the pipeline. So until then, thank you for watching Hair Loss Witchers. God bless.